So you and a few people in the squadron either detected UFOs on your instruments or saw them directly. Tell me the full story of these UFO sightings and uh, to the smallest technical details, because I love those. <laughs> I'll do my best. So we returned from, and when I say we, I mean, my not my squadron, but VFA-11, the Red Rippers. Uh, I was a, a somewhat junior pilot at the time. I joined them on deployment in 2012, where they had been already out there for about six months or so, um, operating in the vicinity of Afghanistan. Uh, I joined them and then we we flew back and still as a, a relatively new guy, we came back and we entered uh, what's considered a maintenance phase where we slow down the tactical flying a bit, uh, kind of recuperate, do some maintenance on the aircraft. And our particular model of the F-18, the lot, the lot number uh, was plumbed uh, for the particular things that were needed to upgrade the radar from what's known as the ABG-73 to the ABG-79. And the APG-73 is a mechanically uh, scanned array radar. Uh, it's a, you know, perfectly fine radar, but the AESA radar is kind of a, you know, magnitude jump in capability, kind of a, an analog digital kind of mindset. So, Got it, so it's a leap to digital. Um, APG-73, so I mean, are these things on a, a carrier? Like, what are we talking about here? This is How our, big is the radar? Yeah, so this is actually the radar, it's in the F-18 itself. Okay, so when you say they were chosen, this is to test uh, the upgrade to the new, the 79, ABG 79. Less of a uh, test and more of just, hey, it's your turn to get the upgrade. Like we're all going to these better radars. Um, they were building ones off the off the line with the new radar, but we were this weird transitionary squadron in the middle that transitioned from the older ones to the new ones. But it's not particularly rare to fly with different types of radar because in the, and we call the fleet replacement squadron, essentially the training ground for the F-18, you have all sorts of F-18s with different radars. So um, you are used to having multiple ones, but in the actual deployable co combat squadron, um, we upgraded. And when we upgraded, we saw that there were objects on the radar that we were seeing the next day in, in this, with this new radar that weren't there with the old radar. And these were sometimes, you know, the same day, you might go on two flights, the one in the morning might be with the older radar, the one in the evening with the new radar. And, you, and you'd see the objects with the, with the new radar. And that's not overly surprising in some sense. Uh, they are more sensitive. Uh, perhaps they're not filtering out everything they should be yet, or perhaps there's some other type of error. Uh, maybe it needs to be calibrated, whatever. It, it was relatively new and we were somewhat used to there being software problems with these types of things occasionally, just like anything else. And so, okay, maybe this is a, a radar software malfunction. We're getting some false tracks, as we call them. Um, what were you seeing? And so what we would see are representations of the object. So this is off of our radar. We're not seeing a visual image here. This is kind of like a what's being displayed to us almost like in a gaming fashion, right? Like our, the icon, right? So the icon is showing us, hey, something is there. And here's the parameters I can understand about it. So this is in the cockpit. There's a display that's showing... Um, some visualization with the radar is detecting. Correct. And there's two different ways to do that. The first one is like the actual data, like the, the radar where um, I am, it's showing me the data kind of as if it's in front of me and I'm selecting those contacts. And there's another screen called the situational awareness page. And that's kind of a God's eye view that brings all that data into one spot. And so uh, I'm going to talk about this from the SA page, from the situational awareness page versus the individual radar ones because it's easier. But Can you, so, sorry, sorry to linger on that. So the individual displays are like first person, and then the SA is when you say God's eye view is like from the top, the integration of all that information as if it's looking down onto the earth. Yes. Is that a good way to summarize it? It is. No? But for the aviator, it's slightly different because those two radar displays I talked about are at the bottom of that display is kind of representative of where I am. And so I see Got what's it. in front of me. Got it. Whereas the situational awareness page, uh, the aircraft is located in the center of that. And then I, all around me, you know, based off of the data link and wherever I'm getting information from, uh, I can see that whole awareness page. I can see all the situation. So um, I'm gonna kind of talk about this from the situational awareness page, which is a top-down view, mm -hmm. just to kind of frame our minds instead of jumping around. And so what we would see out there is we'd see these indications that something would be there and they would have a track file. That track file, that thing that represents the object has a line coming out of it. And that represents, 
that's called the target aspect indicator. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's some tracking from the radar. Correct, so it's showing you where the object's going. This is all pretty cool that the radar can do all this. So radar locks in on d different objects and it tracks them over time. Correct. That's coming from the radar. That's like built-in feature. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. It's out there, we're seeing it. And so we don't have to necessarily like pull things into our our tracker in some sense, right? Like it's all out there and then we can kind of choose to highlight on stuff or to kind of focus in on it more so. Uh, but the information should all be out there. And so we'd see the, that target aspect indicator, that that line, on a typical aircraft, you know, it would kind of look like this. It would be coming out and it would go steady. And if they turn, you, you know, it would be like, boop, 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 and you see them turn, right? Like it's not magic. But this object, they would, the target aspect would kind of be like all over the place, like kind of randomly in the 360 degrees, you know, from that top down view, mm -hmm. that line would be in any place. So kind of, you know, is it unable to determine the, tar the target aspect? Is it stationary, you know, and that's just how it puts it out and it's not used to seeing it. So I'm not saying that's necessarily super weird, but it was different than what we were used to seeing because we weren't used to seeing stationary objects out there very much. Um, and what was also interesting is that these weren't just stationary on a zero wind day, right? These are stationary at 20,000 feet, 15,000 feet, 500 feet, you know, with, with the wind blowing, you know? <laughs> And so much like the sea, you know, when we're up there fighting, it affects everything. We consider the wind when we're, you know, shooting missiles, when we're flying or fuel considerations, it's like operating, you know, in that volume of air, like the ocean, everything's going with the current. And so anything that doesn't go with the current, you know, is immediately kind of identifiable and strange. And that's why these were initially strange is because they would be stationary against the wind. So if you had something like a good drone in a windy conditions, what would that look like? Would it, it would it not come off as stationary? Would it sort of float about kind of thing? No, I think what the drone technology we have today, they could stay within a pretty tight location. Well, I meant like DJI drone, not like, I'm saying like generically speaking, I would not, even, not, not a military drone. No, I, just, I have a DJI drone myself even, and you know, maybe not a hundred knots, but if that thing's in 30 or 40 knot winds, you know, the amount of distance it's going to be kind of doing one of these, like that change is not yeah. something I'm gonna detect from maybe many miles away. Interesting. Um, so it could look very stationary, uh, but that wasn't necessarily, you know, and what's interesting about this story is that there's not like the one smoking gun, right? You have to kind of look at everything. And that's what you know I don't like about um, the Department of Defense and just generally people's take on this is that everything is kind of based around a single image, you know, or that, that one case, but a lot of the interestingness comes from the duration or the time it's been out there, how they're interacting relative to other objects out there. And you don't get that information when you just look at a frame for a second, you know, everyone kind of bites off on the shiny object, but. So you yourself, from your particular slice of things you've experienced and seen directly or ind indirectly, you've kind of built up an intuition about what uh, the things that were being seen. I wouldn't go that far. I've just been able to, you know, eliminate some some variables because of how long I've observed it. So like you said, yes, can a drone stay in a particular position against the wind like that? Certainly, but I don't think it can do that and then go 0.8 Mach for four hours after that, you know? And so when you when you look at it outside of that one, that moment in time, then it eliminates a lot of the potential things it could be, at least from my perspective. So what kind of stuff did you see? Yeah. In, in the instruments. We'd see them flying um, in patterns, uh, kind of racetrack patterns or circular patterns, or just going kind of straight east. Um, I occasionally see them supersonic, 1.1, 1.2 Mach, but typically 0.6 to 0.8 Mach, just for extremely extended periods of time, you know, essentially all the time. <laughs> and this is airspace where there's not supposed to be anything else at all. Um, and it's Pretty far out there. It starts 10 miles off the coast, goes like 300 miles. Can you say the location that we're talking about? Off the coast of Virginia Beach. Got it. And so nobody is supposed to be out there. It's possible for people to be there. It's not necessarily restricted, but it's well monitored and we're out there every day all day. And so, you know, people know to stay clear. If a Cessna goes bumbling in there, everyone's going to know about it. FA is going to, you know, call them out, going to tell us about it. So, um, Incursions happen, not a big deal, but um, it, they're pretty rare, honestly, because everyone knows the area and we've been operating there for decades. And what are the trajectories at 0.6 to 0.8 Mach that these objects were taking? Typically, they would be in some type of circular pattern or kind of racetrack pattern when they were at those speeds, or I just see them kind of, and it wasn't always like a mechanical flight description. And when I say that, I mean like an autopilot is gonna be just very precise, right? It's gonna be locked on straight, 
And whereas I could see an airplane, I could tell if the pilot's flying it, right? Because it's not going to be perfect. Hmm. The computer's not controlling it. And these seemed more like that. Not that they were imprecise, but that they were even much more erratic than that. So like, it wasn't like a straight line in a turn. It was just kind of like a, you know, a weird drift like that in that direction, you know? So it wasn't controlled by a dumb computer or uh, not, not disrespected computers. <laughs> so it wasn't controlled by autopilot kind of technology. That's not the sense that I got. Yeah. So how many people have seen them in the squadron? Uh, sort of how many times were they seen? How many, um, were there times when there's multiple objects? Once we started seeing them on the radar enough and we would get close enough, we'd actually see them on our FLIR as well. So our What's FLIR? advanced targeting uh, pod, uh, it's essentially a infrared camera that we use for targeting mostly in the air to surface environment. We don't use it in the air to air arena. It's just not that good of a tool. Uh, frankly, but um, we would see IR energy emitting from that location where the radar was dropping us off. So, we, you know, the radar, we'd lock onto the object and our sensors would all look there. And so then we could see that it's looking at the right piece of sky, but uh, there's energy actually coming from there. So now we started thinking that, okay, maybe not radar malfunctions, maybe more, maybe something is physically here, of course. And then people started to try to fly by it and see it. And at this point, you know, I would say maybe 80 to 90% of our squadron have probably seen one of these on the radar at this point. Everyone was aware of it. There was small communication, I think, between squadrons of the same area that had the same radar. So I knew it wasn't just our squadron for whatever strange reason, because um, they would be, other squadrons would be out there and we would talk to them, like, hey, like, careful, there's an object. Are you aware of that? You know, so like they would be aware of it. And then, of course, people would want to go see what they look like, right? So people would try to fly by it. I try to fly by him. I like how that's an of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course you don't want to fly by it. Certainly. You know, I, I, there's an uh, there's a argument against that kind of perspective that maybe the thing is dangerous, so maybe we don't. But perhaps that's part of the reason you want to fly by it, is to understand better what it is if it's a threat. We have a lot of context now that we didn't back then, you know? And so it was still a, hey, is this a balloon? Is this a drone? You know, at a certain point. And we're also aware of, you know, potential intelligence gathering operations that could be going on. We're up there flying our tactics, we're emitting, uh, we're practicing our EW, you know, we're turning at particular times, like there's stuff that can be learned, it's not a secret. And, you know, countries keep different fishing vessels and whatnot in international waters off there. So it's not exactly a secret that uh, we're being observed out there. So to think that a foreign hostile or a foreign nation would want to, um, you know, somehow intercept information, whether that's um, uh, our radar signals or our jamming capabilities to try to um, break that down or understand it better, be ready for that next fight. Um, I mean, that's what that's what scares me about this scenario because we didn't jump right to aliens or UFOs. We thought, you know, this is a radar malfunction we need to be aware of, it's a safety issue. And then, you know, this could be a, a, a tactical problem right here because, Everything we do is based off a of, uh, crypto and and locate you know locations. Everything's classified. We do out there, right? And so over time, if you gather enough data about those fights and just monitor them forever, just like uh, some nations uh, do with other uh, pieces of technology or software, um, they could probably learn a lot. And so we have to be cognizant of that fact and defend against it. So what can you say about the other characteristics of these objects, like shape, size? texture, luminosity, how else do you describe object? Is there something that could be said? So you said like this detect down radar, step one, now you have FLIR images that can give you a sense that that's actually a physical object. What else can be said about those mm -hmm. physical objects? So eventually someone did see one with their own eyeballs, um, multiple people, and, it, and they saw it in a kind of somewhat interesting way. Um, the object presented itself at, the exact altitude and geographic location of the entry points into our working areas. So we enter at a very specific point at a certain altitude and people leave the areas at the same point at a lower altitude. Probably one of the busiest pieces of sky on the Eastern Seaboard. So two jets from my squadron went out and they went flying and they entered the area and one of these objects went right between the aircraft. As so they're flying in formation and the object went between the aircraft. They went between the object, I think. I don't think that the object was moving. I don't think it aggressively went at them. I think it was located still there and then they flew through it. Um, but they didn't have it on their radar. Um, and that would, I think the radar might've been malfunctioning. I don't know that for sure. I would like to look into it, but 
my supposition is that if their radar was malfunctioning, it would make sense that they wouldn't avoid the object that was there because they knew these were physical at that point. Um, and we we would go up to these objects all the time, time and try to see them. We couldn't see them. And we didn't know what it was. Um, was it, they, were they just not there and were being fooled? Was something happening? Were they were they moving, dropping out to the last minute? You know, we're, we're going by pretty quick, so it's difficult to tell. Um, but perhaps if his radar wasn't working, he wasn't receiving energy from the jet. And the jet, of course, didn't know that it was there. And so it, whatever the case was, they flew right by and they described it just as a dark gray or, or black cube um, inside a clear translucent sphere. And the kind of the apex of the little cube were touching the inside of that sphere. That's an image that's haunting. So what did they think it is? What did they think at that moment uh, that they... Is it just this kind of cloud of uncertainty that, that they're just describing a geometric object? It's not on radar, so it's unclear what it is. Um, yeah, what was uh, the, any kind of other description they've had of it in terms of the intuition from a pilot's perspective? You know, you have to kind of identify what a thing is. Mm -hmm. To answer the first part, they, they actually canceled the flight and came back because they were, you know, it's like if there's one of these out here and we're almost hitting them and it's right there, then, um, you know, perhaps we need to get a different jet with better radar. But <laughs> so they came back and they're in their gear and they're they're talking to the front desk and talking to Skipper and like, hey, we almost hit one of those damn things out there. And this kind of was one of those kind of slight watershed moments where we all were kind of like, all right, like this is a serious deal now. Yeah. You know, maybe it was a maybe we thought they were balloons or drones or malfunctions, or maybe we thought it was spying. But at the end of the day, if we're going to hit one of these things then we need to, you know, we need to take care of the situation. Um, and that's actually when we started submitting hazard reports or HAZREPs to the Naval, to the Naval Aviation Safety um, kind of communication network. And it's, it, you know, it's not like a, a big proactive thing where people can go investigate. It's more of a data collection mechanism so that you can kind of share that aggregate data and make sure that things are uh, progressing. Um, so it wasn't a mechanism that would result in action being taken, but we were hoping to at least get the message out to whomever was maybe running a classified program that we were not aware of or something like that, that, hey, like you could kill somebody here. Like you've, you've grown too big for your bridges here. Take a step back. Um, so that was, that was our concern at that point. That's kind of where we were thinking this was going. What's the protocol for shooting at a thing? Hmm. Was, was, uh, was there a concern that it's a direct threat, not just surveillance, but a thing that could be, yeah, a threat. Yeah. At least from my perspective, like that never really crossed into my mind. I thought it was potentially an intelligence, um, you know, failure that we could be being watched and information gathered. Uh, but I didn't think that it was something that would proactively engage me in a hostile manner. It wouldn't really make sense either too. It, it would be shocking to like have one of these objects take out an F-18, but there's no real tactical advantage other than fear perhaps. Um, Psychological. Yeah. I've learned a lot about the psychological warfare in Ukraine. That's, that's a big part of the war in terms of when you talk about siege warfare, about warfare, wars that last for many years, for many months, and then perhaps could extend to years. But yes, um, it didn't seem, it didn't fit your conception of a threatening entity. Correct. <sighs> So looking back now from the all the pieces of data you've integrated, you've personally added, what do, what do you think it could be? I don't know. I don't know what it could be. I think we've been able to categorize it successfully into a few buckets. We've been able to say that, you know, this could be US technology that someone put in the wrong piece of sky or, you know, perhaps was developed and tested in an inappropriate spot by someone that uh, wasn't paying best practices. Is but there, uh, sorry to interrupt, is there a sort of uh, modularity to the way the the military operates to where it's possible for one branch not to know about the tests of another? Yeah, it, I think it's perfectly reasonable to think that that could occur, right? And so if we just make that assumption, we can integrate that into our analysis here and just say, okay, but at the point we're at now, you know, we have to assume that that's not the case, right? With everything that's been going on and the statements have been made and the hearings, I think that if it was a, a, a non-communication issue, um, we're in big trouble at this point. What about it being an object from uh, another nation, from China, from Russia? Or even one of our allies, perhaps, right? Maybe allies. that's, an, you know, I don't think it's, 
um, controversial to say that our adult allies could be gathering information about us or anything of that nature, but that would be an extreme case. But I think it's just important to say, right, to not just say Russia or China and just call them the bad guys and assume that if they don't have it, no one can do it. Um, and so from my perspective, you know, anyone else, anyone else, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a foreign power. It could be a non-government entity, perhaps, although I think that's very unlikely. But again, these are these are things you must consider if it, you kind of throw everything everything other than the U.S. under under scrutiny. But, you know, from what has been reported and the behaviors that have been seen, it would be, I would expect to see remnants of that technology elsewhere in the economy. There seems to be too many things that require advanced technology that would be beneficial commercially as well as in other military applications for it to be completely locked away by one of our competitors. Now, I could see us perhaps locking something away if we're already in the lead and having it to pull out as needed. But for someone that's perhaps in a power struggle and they're in second place, they might be more aggressive with the development of different types of technology willing to accept bigger risks. Do you think it could be natural phenomena that we don't yet understand? I think that there are a number of things that this is going to be, right? I don't think there's one thing at the end of the day, but I certainly think that that is part of what some of this could be. I don't think it's p what we were seeing on the East Coast, uh, and I don't think it is related to the Roosevelt incident, or I'll even go out and say the Nimitz incident, but... What's the Roosevelt incident? The Roosevelt incident, typically referred to as the gimbal and or the go fast video. And then the Nimitz is from uh, what the David Fravor has uh, witnessed directly and spoken about. We'll talk about that as well. I'd just love to get your um, your sort of um, interpretation of those incidents. But yeah, so in this particular case, natural phenomena could be a part of the picture, but you're saying not the whole picture. Yes, yes, and we can't discount it. Oh, the other thing is, what about the failure of pilot eyesight, like sort of some deep mixture of actual direct vision, human vision system failure and like psychology, mm -hmm. like um, seeing something weird and then filling in the gaps mm -hmm. because you, in order to make sense of the weird. I've tried to expose myself to a scenarios like that, that I don't necessarily think are right, but I've explored them to see if they could have some truth. And one example is, let's imagine a scenario where if we're seeing these objects every day off the East Coast, I can imagine a technology or an operation where you had some type of traditional propulsion system operating drones in order to gather data like we had discussed. And I could, I could envision a clever enough adversary that could perhaps destroy or somehow remove these objects and replace them with new objects, essentially when we're not looking, right? And that accounts for the large uh, airborne time. And so I, I explore options like that and I try to see, you know, what, what evidence and assumptions need to be made in order to prove or disprove that. And, you know, you would need so much infrastructure, you know, you need so, you need so many assets. And so I try to explore some of those fallacies and some of those concerns. And as aviators, we're trained into many, uh, like actual physical, like eyesight and kind of illusion uh, training. So like at nighttime flying, there's so many things that can happen flying with false horizons. And so we receive hours of, of training on that type of, of stuff, but this just falls outside the category from my perspective. What was the visibility conditions when in the times when people were able to see it? And then are we, we just earlier discussed complete nighttime darkness. Mm. Um, in this case, was was it during the day? It was a perfectly clear day, that, that, that particular incident, yep. In a world that's full of mystery, I have to ask, what do you think is the possibility that it's not of this earth origin? Mm -hmm. I like the term non-human intelligence in a sense, because Again, there's so much. There's a lot of assumptions in there that may cause us to go down the wrong roads. It could, you know, these could be something that are weather phenomena of Earth, right, or something else that is just something we don't understand and can't imagine right now. That's still of this Earth. Um, if we consider extraterrestrials or something that came from a, a physical place far away in space time, um, you know, that leads us to some detection assumptions that we would need to make, and so. I just try to not categorize it under anything and just say, hey, is this demonstrating intelligence? 
and start from there as a single object. What can we learn about it kinematically, how it's performing? What does that mean for its energy source? What does that mean for the G-forces inside? Uh, and then step it out a level and say, okay, how are these interacting with our fighters? If they are, how are they interacting with the weather and their environment? How are they interacting with each other? So can we look at these and how they're interacting perhaps as a swarm, uh, especially off the East Coast where this is happening all the time with multiple objects, right? And so we might be able to determine some things about their maybe, you know, center capabilities or the areas of focus, you know, if we can determine uh, how they're working in conjunction with each other. But, you know, seeing one little flash of an object uh, doesn't provide that type of insight. Um, but we have the systems for it, but, and, and it's kind of, I mean, on irony, but it's, it's a fact of life, the reality that many of these well-deployed, highly capable systems are held under the military umbrella, which makes it difficult to provide that data for scientific analysis. So there's probably a lot more data on these objects that's not being, that's not made available probably even within the military for analysis. I think so, yeah. I think there's a lot of data that could be made available. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I've been engaged with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics to build, you know, a large resources of cross-domain expertise so that if or when that data is available or that there's additional analysis needed, you know, we can spin up those teams and make that analysis.